We've got 13 herbs for parasite infections and two herbs that I never use. So when we're talking about parasite infections, I kind of boil them down to a category or a list of parasites that need complete eradication. Gotta get them out, gotta eliminate them, have to retest, make sure they're gone. And then I've got a handful of parasites that I'm not so concerned about. Always looking to reduce their numbers, make it less friendly in environment, support the gut health, and look for a symptom resolution. If we do a little kind of PCR stool test again, and we do see you know a small amount of these uh, parasites, I'm not overly concerned. I'm more concerned about your symptoms. A lack of symptoms would not indicate going after these parasites more. I think damage can be done to the gut when it's not needed. So focusing on the parasites that I do think need very direct, sometimes aggressive treatment, the top of the list that I see more frequently, not commonly, but, but more frequently would be Giardia. The next one down that I've only seen a handful of times, it's pretty darn uncommon here in Australia, would be Entamoeba histolytica. And then the next level down from there that I think I've only seen maybe once or twice would be Cryptosporidium. On the kind of list of parasites that I don't kind of preferentially treat aggressively unless I need to would be Blastocystis species and Diantamoeba fragilis. And I have my reasons there. You know, we can go into that in a separate video, but I find that if you can work to make those bugs play fair, reduce their numbers, don't make it such a friendly place for them to kind of thrive, most patients see symptom resolution even when they retest and they find a little bit of those bugs still in their stool. On the other hand, Giardia, Entamoeba histolytica, Cryptosporidium, shumpf, it's gotta go. The other kind of category of parasites that I never see on stool testing would be worms or helminths. That excludes pinworms. I do see and treat pinworms reasonably frequently. Um, they're pretty common with young families or large families. Um, so that, that's definitely uh, an exception to the rule on the worm front. So listing the top 13 herbs for parasites, I like to think about them in different categories. Starting off with my favorite category, the polyphenol and tannin rich herbs. So top of the top of the top right there would be pomegranate. Next level down would be clove. Then I'd be thinking of oregano leaf if we really needed to, these are all in tinctures by the way, liquid herbs, if we really need to, we can kick up the strength of that oregano leaf by using oregano oil. I like to keep oregano oil in the wings. Sometimes I'll be recommending it up front just to get that momentum if we're dealing with a really, really significant parasite load. Gotta clear it, get people feeling better. I'm not opposed to using stronger therapies when it's indicated. Thyme, leaf, thyme essential oil, cinnamon, cinnamon essential oil, and then guava leaf as well. Those herbs there, they get a huge, huge, huge amount of play in the dispensary. Some of them are in my top five herbs. Most of them are in my top 10 herbs. So again, those are pretty popular herbs that patients will be working with if they come to me with a parasite infection. Then the next one, as long as it's tolerated, I would recommend high dose crushed fresh garlic for parasites. It's gonna taste terrible. It's gonna make you smell. You're gonna be sweating that garlic smell out of your pores and your breath. It's not gonna be pleasant, but sometimes it is just so strongly indicated and so darn effective if it's tolerated. If it's not tolerated and we are dealing with a, um, you know, a significant parasite load, I will recommend garlic extracts. Sometimes that's little garlic oil capsules. And then the other one would be like an Allison Rich extract. Alimax here in Australia from Biomedica and Alimed if you're international. Moving on to some of the stronger ones, the real kind of sledgehammers of the uh, you know antimicrobial, antiparasitic herb world, the king, king antimicrobial would be Coptis 
chinensis or gold thread. And this is equivalent. It's probably not as strong, it's probably not as broad spectrum, but it's the equivalent of a herbal antibiotic. So it's a good last resort. I keep it in the wings. And if a patient's just like, man, we just need to get rid of this. We're not having great success. We keep testing and it keeps coming back or the symptoms aren't improving. Then I'm thinking about doing antibiotics. We'll say, well, just give me one more crack. We'll bring in the Coptis chinensis and we'll see if we can get some movement there. I would be mixing that with a whole raft of berberine and alkaloid rich herbs. So that would be things like philodendron, rich in berberines, Oregon grape root, rich in berberine and berberine related alkaloids and barberry. And I would also be mixing in Baykal skullcap into that mix as well. You can't mix the polyphenol and the tannins in with the alkaloids, strong alkaloids. They form a complex in your liquid and everything just turns into gunk and it does, doesn't kind of work at all. The 13th herbal medicine that I would use for parasite infections would be myrrh. And I use a very strong liquid extract of myrrh. From memory, I think it's a one in five. And it's that uh, myrrh resin that's been extracted into ethanol. And it is so, so, so hard to take. It tastes so, so bad, but it is so darn effective. It is a strong antiparasitic. Two herbs that I almost never use, I would keep them in the wings. And if we're desperate, I might bring them in, would be propolis and also golden seal. It's a total bummer. I think both of these herbs are potent and they have a lot to offer. Golden seal is extremely expensive, very hard to get your hands on, and that's because it's endangered. It's very hard to grow and we're losing this herb. This herb is on the brink of extinction. Just a total tragedy. Propolis, on the other hand, I am concerned about the sourcing of propolis. I'm concerned about the quality of the propolis. And you know, if we're looking for the highest quality herbs, organic, well-grown, sustainable, propolis is not a herb that fits that bill. It is a very, very, very strong antiparasitic, antifungal, antimicrobial, uh, antibacterial. So it is a real shame. And if we can find a good, sustainable, ethical source of propolis, I might change my tune on that. So thanks for watching. We've got the 13 herbs that I would use for parasite infections, depending on the parasite, depending on the presentation. Two herbs I wouldn't use. Let me throw it over to you. Tell me what you think. Have you worked with these herbs? Are there any that I've missed? I'd love to hear from you. Leave a comment below, like the video, subscribe, and reach out to us. If you're living in Australia or New Zealand, you're dealing with a digestive issue, just get in touch with the clinic. I'd love to hear from you.